What's up, people? Today we're taking a look at A Push Period 8, 1945, the end of World War II, all the way up until 1980, the election of Ronald Reagan. On the exam, this period is about 15% of the A Push test. So let's get started. Some changing continuity post World War II. It's important to keep in mind that, unlike in the post World War I period, the U.S. will play a key role in post World War II affairs. Let me give you an example. U.S. does not join the League of Nations following World War I. Member Wilson's plan is rejected by the Senate, but the U.S. will join the new international organization, the United Nations, the U.N., in 1945. There will be some similarities. Member Wilson with his 14 points. Well, a lot of those similar ideas are going to be found in the document signed by Roosevelt and Churchill called the Atlantic Charter. Most important thing in post-World War II is the Cold War is going to begin. It will be an ideological, political, and military struggle between the two superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union. And this thing's going to last from around 1946-ish to 1991, the fall of the Soviet Union. Throughout the Cold War, the U.S. is going to pursue a policy called containment. It's going to be articulated by George Kennan, and the U.S. is going to pursue a variety of methods and ways to try to contain communism. Most of the time, this is going to be done with indirect military conflict and support. Very often, you're going to see during this time the U.S. pledging military and financial assistance to countries trying to resist perceived or real communist aggression. So for example, you get the Truman Doctrine, where we give $400 million to Greece and Turkey to keep them from falling to the communists. We are successful in both countries. Marshall Plan is established under the Truman administration. We give billions of dollars of money to Western Europe to rebuild countries, especially France and Italy, so that in the elections, people won't be inclined to vote for the communist. That is a huge success as well. During the Chinese Civil War, the U.S. is going to give a lot of money to the nationalists under Chiang Kai-shek. However, that is not going to be a successful policy because in 1949, Mao, the communists, declared the People's Republic of China. The U.S. is going to pursue all sorts of collective security agreements. We've already mentioned the United Nations, but we're also going to join the first permanent peacetime military alliance kind of forgetting the warnings of George Washington's farewell address when we sign up and join the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, NATO. And basically what this military alliance said was if there was an attack on one member, it was considered an attack on all. The U.S. is also going to be involved in indirect military conflict with its use of the CIA, especially starting with Dwight Eisenhower's administration, where the CIA is going to try to get rid of regimes in Guatemala and Iran. And then finally, as time goes on, the U.S. is going to find itself overcommitted around the world. And under President Nixon, you're going to have the Nixon Doctrine, where we're basically going to say to Vietnam and other countries, you are going to have to do your own fighting. The U.S. will provide you with money and military equipment, but not U.S. soldiers at all times. This is going to be known as the policy of Vietnamization in Vietnam. There's also going to be military buildup throughout the Cold War. It's one of the key parts of trying to contain communism, and you are going to have an arms race throughout the Cold War. This can really be seen in Truman building up the military during the Korean War under the recommendations of NSC-68. Under Eisenhower, you have the New Look policy where there's this stress and reliance on nuclear weapons. More bang for the buck was the idea, and really key to this is this idea of massive retaliation that we will deter the Soviets by building up our nuclear arsenal they will be reluctant to make moves because they know we gonna blow them up. Kennedy's gonna alter his foreign policy military spending with something called flexible response having a variety of options available because you can't use nukes in all situations. Another part of the Cold War is going to be the space race. You're going to see this where, especially after Sputnik in 1957, we feel like we're falling behind the Soviet unions. You have this mass funding for not only NASA, but also education with the National Defense of Education Act. And of course, remember Kennedy with this famous speech says, we are going to put a man on the moon, and this will happen in 1969 when the U.S. becomes the first country to put a man on the moon. Now over in that direct military 
column, there is going to be moments where the U.S. is going to use direct military force to stop communism, most famously in Korea, starting in 1950, when North Korea invades South Korea, crossing the 38th parallel. This is a limited war, meaning the war is only meant to stop communism from South Korea. There's a debate during the war about this strategy, but ultimately containment is achieved by Truman and then Eisenhower. And then, of course, the big one is going to be the Vietnam War, where really after the Gulf of Tonkin resolution, where we're allegedly attacked in the Gulf of Tonkin, President Lyndon Johnson escalates American involvement. We start Operation Rolling Thunder, where we're bombing North Vietnam. And after three years of fighting, we're being told the American people are near victory. However, the Tet Offensive in 1968 really proves otherwise, and the war increasingly becomes controversial. All of these are examples of ways the U.S. sought to contain or threaten communism during the Cold War. It's important to keep in mind throughout the Cold War that there were periods of detente or relaxation of tensions. There were thaws in the Cold War, and you could see this periods of mutual coexistence. Really kind of the first thaw of the Cold War can be seen under Eisenhower, where Ike calls for a relaxation of tensions and a reduction in the arms race with the Soviet counterpart Nikita Khrushchev. They have a Atoms for Peace plan proposed. In fact, in 1955, they meet. Eisenhower meets with Soviet leaders, and you get the Geneva Conference. And many start to talk about the spirit of Geneva between these two superpowers. However, this period of coexistence is going to be ruined by the shooting down of the U-2 spy plane incident. But once again, following the Cuban Missile Crisis, where the two superpowers were close to war in 1962, a direct hotline was installed between Washington, D.C. and Moscow. Perhaps the period of detente that you should most be familiar with is under Nixon and his foreign policy advisor Kissinger. And Nixon's really going to seek to take advantage of the distrust and rivalry between China and the Soviet Union, this so-called Sino-Soviet split. And he's going to do so when he visits China, the first U.S. president to do so, in February of 1972 to meet with Mao. Shortly after that, he helps negotiate the Strategic Arms Limitation Talks, SALT-1, which was designed to limit nuclear weapons. However, further talks are going to be ruined. SALT-2 will be ruined when the Soviet Union invades Afghanistan in 1979. But keep in mind, the Cold War is going to fluctuate between these periods of direct conflict, indirect conflict, and periods of of detente. Another important thing to understand about period 8 is how Cold War policies led to debate over the power of the federal government, acceptable ways of pursuing international and domestic goals, and the proper balance between liberty and order. And some examples of these themes can be seen in the debate, especially the growing debate, over the presence of a growing nuclear arsenal. Eisenhower warned the nation in his farewell address about the military-industrial complex and how the growing arms race was a threat to American domestic life. You are going to see various arms controls agreements, the most famous one, of course, probably being the SALT agreement, the strategic arms limitation talks, but you're also going to see this debate over the power of the executive branch and the growing power of the presidency. There was a dispute between Truman and his general Douglas MacArthur. MacArthur is fired for criticizing Truman's handling of the war, the limited war strategy. The Gulf of Tonkin resolution in 1963 gives President Johnson a blank check, and many people see this as a excessive amount of presidential power that widens the Vietnam War. And in 1973, you're going to have the War Powers Act, which is designed to limit presidential war-making power. Throughout the Cold War, you're going to see domestic opposition to Cold War policies. There was limited debate over the Korean War. Some people debated the merits of a limited war, especially Republicans who criticized Truman's handling of the war. They saw him as being too weak. And the big moment, though, in domestic opposition is going to be with Vietnam. The Vietnam War bitterly divided the nation between hawks, those people who were for the war, and doves, those who were against the war. And really events like the Tet Offensive in 1968 and the bombing of Cambodia escalate and increase the anti-war movement. 
In fact, the news of the bombing of Cambodia during Nixon's presidency led to the Kent State protests, which led to the deaths of four college students, and college campus protests spread throughout the country. And as a result of the Cold War, you are going to have this impacting domestic life. The challenge arose over the effort to balance civil liberties with order and security. One of the key things that happens in the late 40s and 50s is a widespread fear of communist influence and infiltration in American life. Revelations of people like Alger Hiss and the Julius and Ethel Rosenbergs, revelations of spy rings in America causes widespread fear. This leads to the rise of Senator Joseph McCarthy and McCarthyism, this accusing of people with little or no evidence. And in the late 40s, early 50s, you have a second Red Scare. In fact, even before this time, you have the Federal Employee Loyalty Program, which investigated the background of federal employees within the government, and many people lost their jobs. In fact, you have the House of Un-American Activities Committee, HUAC, which is restarted after World War II, and it is designed to root out and search for communist influence in American life. Very often, people were brought before the committee and forced to name names. For example, you have the Hollywood Ten brought before the committee, in spite of this criticisms over these policies, it's important to note, though, both Republicans and Democrats supported the policy of containing communism. However, there were disputes at the methods and ways to do this. A really important idea to keep in mind is post-World War II decolonization. And you have the collapse of colonial empires leading both the U.S. and the Soviet Union competing for influence in Asia, Latin America, Africa, and the Middle East. You're going to see this in Vietnam as Ho Chi Minh is trying to get rid of the French following World War II. And you're going to see that these areas of the world that were former colonies are going to be the target of both U.S. and Soviet foreign policy. Some examples of this you can be seen in the Middle East. The U.S. had a variety of interests. Ideologically, we had support for Israel immediately following World War II, but also any regime that was non-communist, economic concerns, access to oil, as well as military strategic concerns. Some examples of U.S. policy and how it was impacted by the Cold War could be seen in Operation Ajax. President Eisenhower in 1953 used the CIA to help overthrow the democratically elected Iranian government. This causes all sorts of problems. And in the Suez Crisis, President Nasser of Egypt, he is a nationalist, he nationalizes the Suez Canal, and as a result, England, France, and Israel, without consulting the United States, attacks Egypt. This causes a huge crisis, and eventually Eisenhower has to intervene to end the war, and prompts Eisenhower to issue the Eisenhower Doctrine, which basically stated the U.S. promised economic and military aid to any Middle Eastern country threatened by communist aggression. In 1960, you get the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, OPEC, formed, which is designed to control the oil supply and trade. This is going to have a huge impact on U.S. energy policy. And during the Yom Kippur War, during Nixon's administration, Egypt and Syria suddenly attacked Israel, and the U.S. provides aid to Israel in the form of economic and military support. This contributes to a, an oil embargo. It's imposed on the United States by the oil-rich nations in OPEC. And finally, another thing to keep in mind with regard to the Middle East, the Camp David Accords in 1978, President Jimmy Carter helps negotiate a deal in which Israel and Egypt sign a peace agreement the U.S. is also heavily going to be involved in Latin America, and in Latin America, the U.S. supported non-communist regimes with varying levels of democracy. In fact, in 1954, the CIA under President Eisenhower is going to overthrow the democratically elected Arbenz government. They will do so because the government is going to nationalize land held by the United Fruit Company, and the CIA is going to help bring into power a very undemocratic government, but pro-U.S. government in Guatemala. There's going to be a crisis in 1959 when in Cuba, Fidel Castro led a revolution that removed the Cuban dictator Batista from power, and he begins nationalizing land in Cuba. This leads Eisenhower to issue an embargo against Cuba, turning Cuba closer and closer to the Soviet Union. There you could see Castro and Khrushchev having a cuddle session, and eventually when JFK takes office, he tries the Bay of Pigs plan, 
Cuban exiles are going to go to Cuba, try to overthrow Castro, and it is going to fail. Not too long after that, in 1962, the U.S. discovers the presence of Soviet missiles, nuclear missiles, in Cuba. This leads to the Cuban Missile Crisis, and the U.S. and the Soviet Union are extremely close to war. Luckily, they negotiate an end to this crisis. If you want to get more information about any of this material, make sure you check out the other videos in the description. And don't forget about part two of the Period 8 review series where we break down the domestic stuff for you. If the video helped you at all, click like on the video. And if you haven't already done so, subscribe, tell all your friends to do the same. And remember when you go to take that A-Push exam in May, that you ride in there like a boss, like John Brown in that photo, and you knock it out and you get a five. Thank you for watching. Have a beautiful day. Peace.